Welcome to another episode of the Design 30 Podcast. In this podcast, I provide design strategies and tools to improve creativity, innovation, and overall design confidence. As always, if you would like to support the pod, please subscribe to the Design 30 YouTube, Substack, and of course, the Design 30 Podcast. And if you would, please rate the podcast. That is incredibly helpful. So in this episode, I wanted to do a little bit of a follow-up to last week's episode, which was on the Q caller. And some of the feedback I received on this was I didn't really go into the design side of the Q caller much. Uh, the purpose was more of just reviewing what it is and kind of introducing people to it as a product. Uh, I was really impressed and just excited about what it was as a product. So that was the core focus, but there are a lot of design aspects and design principles that I think you can pull from uh, the Q caller as a product. And so that's what I wanna do this week. Um, I have basically three primary design takeaways that we will go over in some deep t- in some detail. I also uh, released, or well, by the time you listen to this episode, I will have released a new Substack that will detail these design takeaways in a little bit more, uh, I don't know, go into a little bit more depth and in the writing format's always a little bit different. So please subscribe to the Design 30 Substack. You can do it for free and you will get, uh, or you'll be able to access that article, uh, which I just wrote. So this episode will be similar to that, uh, but I'll be pulling some excerpts from it and just riffing on those a little bit and diving into uh, these design principles that I think are very well exemplified by the Q caller and worth discussing. So those three primary takeaways are, number one, Simple is hard. Number two, change your perspective. And number three, good design improves lives. So I'm gonna start off by reading a few excerpts from my recent Substack post that I just mentioned. So first one, uh, back to the first design principle I mentioned, simple is hard. Although the Q collar appears to be a simple piece of plastic wrapped around an athlete's neck, it was by no means easy for the Q30 innovations to design. To perfect the design and achieve FDA approval, it took over 10 years of development. This included more than 28 independent clinical studies on the effectiveness and safety of the device. Thousands of hours and millions of dollars later, they ended up with a product looking simple and straightforward. That is what it takes. Complexity is often the result of laziness and simplicity the result of rugged dedication. Number two, change your perspective. The two doctors who created the cue collar approached the design from a completely different perspective. Instead of looking at ways to improve the helmet, they hypothesized a way to manipulate the body so that it can protect itself. They looked at this problem from the inside out rather than the outside in. This birthed the concept of using a device to increase the blood volume in the brain ever so slightly, but just enough to reduce brain movement and therefore reduce brain slosh in the associated brain injuries. Number three, good design improves lives. Although there is no way to remove all of the danger from inherently dangerous activities, the cue collar helps reduce the negative impacts these contact sports have on our health long after we stop playing. Brain injuries can cause debilitating diseases later on in life such as dementia, Alzheimer's, and CTE, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. The simple yet effective design of the cue collar helps reduce damage done to the brain and therefore reduce the likelihood of developing these diseases later on. This product is a shining example of how creative thinking and good design quite literally improve not only our health, 
but also our lives and longevity. So those are the three main points I want to touch on. And once again, you can become a free subscriber to the Design30 Substack um, if you want to read the entire article. To start, I want to touch on this uh, point that I made in the, the very first example, which is complexity is often the result of laziness and simplicity the result of rugged dedication. So what I mean here is the first iteration of a product is typically unnecessarily complicated. Or maybe I shouldn't say unnecessarily, but it's typically more complicated because you're taking all of these different ideas and thoughts and concepts and you're trying to package them into a single design. So that often just ends up with a, a complicated a design to start. You're trying to, you're kind of brain dumping all these ideas into a single thing, whether that's writing, uh, it could be coding, UX design, mechanical design, really just any sort of product design in general, or writing in general, or podcasting in general. But that's why it's so important to have different steps or processes for editing. You want to prototype and iterate and have design reviews because your first stab at something, you're going to have all of these different competing ideas and to make them all work together, it often creates a very complex uh, idea, a very complex design, and that's normal. That's how, that's how these things start. Um, but if you leave it there, you're leaving it as a very complex design, a very complex roundabout idea or concept that needs editing. It needs to be iterated. You need to go through these design reviews and have critical feedback that uh, forces you to go back and rethink certain design aspects, rethink certain uh, concepts or features, and to simplify them, to uh, reduce the complexity. You want to uh, make it more understandable. You want to make it more perhaps manufacturable. You want to make it easier to process. Uh, this increases the overall efficiency of the product, which typically involves making it more simple in some way, shape, or form. It's important to note here that just because something looks simple or appears simple or operates simply doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't any complexity to it, but often what you're doing is hiding the complexity from the user. So for example, if you look at the Google search screen, it's a really simple design. It's basically just one little search box where you type in your question or whatever you're looking for. But behind the scenes, you have this insanely complex algorithm, all of this data management and, you know, whatever else is going on behind the scenes that allows you to search a question and immediately within, I don't know, 10 billionths of a second, something like that, have all of these results, which, you know, are incredibly useful and are related exactly, they pertain exactly to the question you just asked. So there's a lot of complexity that is shielded. So part of what this editing, prototyping, iteration phase does is uh, if it doesn't eliminate the complexity, it can move the complexity to some place in the product that isn't apparent or visually uh, in the face of the user. So you're kind of separating it. So it gives it this very simplistic feel, uh, which is difficult and complex in and of itself to achieve, but it gives off this uh, experience of simplicity to the user. So simple doesn't mean easy, doesn't mean cheap or fast, and it most definitely doesn't mean lazy. Uh, in fact, it's often or very often the opposite. To arrive at a simple design, it usually requires very difficult, long hours and an incredible amount of dedication. And the result of this, or to achieve this, it usually takes money, so it's expensive. 
it's expensive to have rewrites and to create prototypes, uh, having brainstorms where you have a bunch of engineers or a bunch of workers in one room. That's a very expensive meeting. So you have to be willing to invest and spend money on these things. Uh, and all of it takes time. So at the end of the day, simple is hard. Another excerpt uh, that I want to point out from this Substack post is instead of looking at ways to improve the helmet, they hypothesized a way to manipulate the body so that it can protect itself. They looked at this design problem from the inside out rather than the outside in. So this is all about changing your perspective. Uh, as humans, we tend to get stuck in a particular point of view. And it's really easy when you, you get really good at your job and that's where you spend all of your time in this particular job. And that creates a very specific perspective, perhaps on your product, uh, perhaps on the problem that you're trying to solve or even on just a perspective on your company and what your company does. Uh, so it's a very normal thing that we all get caught up to caught up in and it takes a lot of effort and work to break out of that perspective you have to find uh, perhaps it's uh, users of your product that you need to interview and talk to it can be as simple as just talking to more people in your company uh, it could be going to your marketing department or going and talking with your production technicians the people who are actually building the product and gaining their perspectives on maybe it's a new product you're working on or a previous product that you're trying to innovate on and improve over time, whatever the case might be, it's, it's imperative that you find a way to change your perspective. And for the Q caller, it really would have been easy for uh, people to just keep focusing on, on the helmet, which is obviously the uh, thing that you would imagine prevents concussions or protects your brain from concussions. Obviously, that's why helmets are shaped the way they are and why they're made of plastic with padding on the inside. Or you could look at other equipment that football players are wearing, such as a shoulder pads, or you might imagine some sort of a neck stabilizing device that keeps your head from oh, having whiplash, which would also protect the brain. But for the Q caller, we had a completely different, or they had a completely different perspective, which came from the two doctors that you know, founded the company and started, uh, came up with this concept and idea of the product. They very much were looking at it from an inside out approach. They were thinking uh, or using root cause analysis in a lot of ways, because as we discussed on the last podcast, the root cause isn't so much that helmets aren't uh, strong enough or absorbing enough of the force. The root cause is your brain is sloshing around inside your skull, which is causing the damage to your brain cells uh, and, you know, destroying different connections, which has all of these long-term or potential long-term effects. So being doctors, they were looking at it from how your body works and how it functions. And so naturally I thought, well, how can we use the body and its functions to protect us? How can we use it to help protect the brain? And this is what led to the insight about uh, blood volume inside the brain. And if we just increase that slightly, we suck up some of that space uh, inside the skull. So your brain isn't sloshing around quite as much. Uh, there's less uh, room to move. So there's less damage that can be done. Uh, I think you could uh, maybe picture this uh, looking at a a car. When you get in a car accident, you have the airbag that shoots out. And part of what the airbag does is it absorbs the force of you moving forward. It also just takes up that space. There's a lot of space between you and your steering wheel. And when you get into an accident, if you <laughs> flew through that space and hit your steering wheel, that would cause a lot of damage. So what the... Uh, airbag does is actually it sucks up that space so there's less motion um, it's obviously full of air and it's soft so it it distributes a lot of that force i mean there's a lot of reasons for it but as an analogy you can kind of think of 
this increased blood volume in the brain is just taking up that space, which reduces the impact of your brain hitting the inside of your skull. Or at least that's the way I think of it. Uh, there could be obviously uh, much more accurate medical descriptions of what's going on there, but I think that's a good mental model of of how this product uh, protects your brain and uh, why it's innovative and just such a different way of protecting brains than has traditionally been attempted by improving the design of helmets, shoulder pads, or neck braces, things like that. So you always need to find a way in your design process to change your perspective. Again, if you would have asked the engineers working on football helmets what to do to prevent concussions, there's a very high likelihood that they would have had all these different ideas about changing the padding uh, inside the helmet, perhaps looking at different plastics to make and manufacture the helmet out of, all these different things. But when you looked or when you took the perspective of a doctor, they said, well, maybe we can actually just manipulate the body in some minor way that will help the body to protect itself and help the brain to protect itself. So that's the important of this perspective change and the ability to either talk to someone with a different perspective or to put yourself in the shoes of someone else to give yourself, give yourself that different perspective. And finally, the last excerpt I want to read uh, is on uh, the design principle number three. And this says, this product is a shining example of how creative thinking and good design quite literally improves not only our health, but also our lives and longevity. Here the point is how design can be used to improve other people's lives. Concussions and traumatic brain injuries can have long-term, significant, very negative consequences. And the doctors and engineers and athletes who developed this Q-Collar uh, product, they had to put in a lot of time, money, energy, and expertise to accomplish this goal of improving athletes' lives, of protecting athletes. And I think this is such a, it's such a big deal and something I wanted to point out because sports have such a positive impact on people's lives, and I would argue a positive impact on society. There's so much you can learn and take away from being involved in sports and learning how to interact with teammates and how to be a good teammate, how to be dedicated to something and push yourself physically and understanding how far you can push yourself. Often we don't know what our own limits are, and I think sports are a great way to discover those limits or to push beyond them. And finally, I mean, sports are such a good way to instill discipline uh, in people and especially in kids or young adults. But unfortunately, we're all very aware of the negative impacts that a lot of sports can have on our health, especially contact sports. Um, and football, of course, is the one we all think of, but also soccer, uh, basketball, lacrosse, there's so many sports where there's a risk of injury to our brains. And what this product does is allow people to play these sports and gain the benefits that I just discussed uh, from participating, but also but it reduces the risk uh, that is becoming more and more prominent. And we're seeing uh, more publicized and we're actually, we're learning uh, that a lot of the issues people have later on in life could be coming from these uh, traumatic brain injuries we suffer when we're younger. So what the Q collar and its designers are allowing is the benefits of sports to continually be enjoyed, but without all of the extreme risks that often come with it. And in this case, uh, there's a very tangible improvement to athletes' lives uh, that can be directly correlated with this new product. And that's what we as designers have to offer the world, in my opinion. We have the ability to create products which improve the lives of others. I would argue this 
is our mission and our purpose as product designers. Good design improves lives. So these three takeaways of simple is hard, change your perspective, and good design improves lives are why the Q caller has made actually a pretty big impact on me. And it's been something that I just keep thinking about and how well it represents these, what I would term fundamental principles of design. I always want to recognize and applaud good design and good products when I see them. Uh, And this product is in a lot of ways, a perfect example of how dedication, creative thinking, and good design can be implemented in a single product to improve the world, improve the lives of thousands, if not millions of people. And that's something that I think is really impressive and really quite inspiring for me. And I hope for you as product designers. Now, the Design 30 Discipline for the week. I want you to write these three principles down uh, somewhere where you will see them throughout the week. So number one, simple is hard. Number two, change your perspective. And number three, good design improves lives. And keep them in mind throughout the week. So whether that's putting them on sticky notes in your bathroom or perhaps writing them on a whiteboard at work, keep them somewhere that you can continually see them, think about them, and come up with different ways of implementing them in whatever product you're designing, whatever article you're writing, or whatever podcast you're creating. Just keep them accessible. And that's all for now. Please share this episode if you found it useful and have a great week of design. As always, remember, design more, despair less. Thanks for listening.